Dorothy J. McLean Fellows Conference and the Festschrift for Mark Siegler. Our first session uh, this morning promises to be a waker-upper. Uh, we have three distinguished speakers, Richard Epstein, Ed Lauman, and Ed Lawler, talking about the McLean Center as part of the University of Chicago. Unfortunately, Arthur Rubenstein uh, could not make it. Richard Epstein is the James Parker Hall Distinguished Service Professor of Law at the University of Chicago. He's been here almost as long as Dr. Siegler, since 1972. He's been a senior fellow at the Hoover Institute. He taught law at University of Southern California, where he served as interim, uh, no, here he served as interim dean. Where were you interim dean? Fellow of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. He and Dr. Siegler have collaborated for many years on numerous studies, and he's one of the well, uh, best known liberal thinkers in America, <laughs> Richard Epstein. I want to read from the same CV that he was reading from. Who is this well known liberal thinker that you're talking about? Well, I mean, I, I, I want to thank uh, John for telling me what the topic was something about 14 seconds ago. Um, and I will actually get to the topic now that I've had some time to think about what I want to say. But, but I think first what one has to do is, is to explain this as, as a, the center is a projection and an extension of Marx's personality. And in order to understand Marx's personality, what you have to do is to go back to some basic legal and economic conceptions. Uh, the title of this particular talk, in fact, is the, known as the multiplier effect. And the effort is to explain how the concept of leverage starts with physics, goes into finance, and ends up in its highest and most perfect incarnation in Marx Sigler. Uh, <laughs> the way in which one starts, of course, the situation with leverage is it tells us something about the way in which language actually works and explains why it is that we really do have to be interdisciplinary. Um, a lever, or lever is whatever we call it, is of course something which allows you to find a fulcrum, put a heavy weight at one end and a light weight at the other end, and use the length of the rod in order to project the heavier weight. And so what it does in effect is if you can do this, you can be like Archimedes or Sigler and move the world. And the whole problem about this is the question is in physics, are levers all to the good or are they not to the bad? And those of us who've ever studied economics or law or medicine or any area in which we've had trade-offs would quickly recognize uh, that our friend Archimedes got it wrong when he said you can do this, uh, move the world with a lever if you stand far enough away, because he never asked himself the question of what's this lever going to be made of, and here is the problem. Uh, the further you move back on the lever, no matter what the substance or material you use in, the more likely it is when you put pressure on it, this thing is going to be subject to some kind of pressure and it could possibly break. And so what you therefore have to worry about when you design these kinds of institutions is to go far enough out so that you can actually get some leverage out of it, but not so far out that the whole thing will start to collapse. The term leverage, of course, then has another incarnation, and this turns out to be a financial term. Um, I hope most of you have heard of the idea of leverage and now the idea of deleveraging, which is the, uh, shall we say, the raise du jour. And the whole theory about leverage in this particular market is that what you do is you find a situation in which people can borrow money, put in a little money of their own, and then in effect make their profits far greater by virtue of the fact that when the value of the underlying asset increases, they pay off the debt and keep all the appreciation for themselves. So to give you a very simple kind of numerical example, if you buy an asset for $100 and buy $90, the great news is if it goes up by 10%, you double your money because it's now worth 110, you pay back your debt, you've got 20 after 10. But this lever can also break as well. And so what happens is if the thing goes down $10, it turns out you're wiped out because it have no equity cushion. And we've discovered that things that go up often do go down, and the painful process of deleveraging is the desperate effort to try and sell off your debts before you find yourself into bankruptcy. And we've seen a large number of industrial in investment bank houses that haven't been able to do it. So what does this have to do with Mark? Well, <laughs> uh, Mark is essentially a leverage man. Um, 
Uh, it is actually, I, I've thought back, I've known him now, I guess I have to tell you, since 1973, where our first acquaintance was on an airplane, where Mark was uh, leveraging himself again. Anna was taking care of two twins. Mark was sitting in front of us reading a newspaper, and my wife wanted to hit him over the head for not helping his wife. Um, do this. And this, of course, ties in with what we heard yesterday. Uh, the only at dinner, the best line of the dinner, of course, was from Stan Goldblatt. He says that Anna Sigler was a single woman with five children. At that, at that particular point, it turned out that she had three. And it turned out we were behind. But anyhow, that's what we met and so forth. And in the 35 years that I've known Mark, I've tried to reflect on the following question. Apart from medical issues, when was the last time I'd ever asked him for a favor? And I can't think of a single time. Then I put the question in the opposite direction. I said, <laughs> when was the last time that he asked me for the favor? And the first time. And the time before that. And, and essentially, the way in which life works with Mark is that it's always the low-key approach. Buddy, I need a favor is the very line. And so I reach into my pocket, and I hope that a dime will satisfy him. But almost invariably, it turns out, well, do I have the dime, Mark? No, it's a nickel, but that's okay. Um, I, I always try to figure out exactly what it is that he wants. And essentially, his great ability as an academic, I think, and also in so many ways as an internist, is to enlist the leverage, the labor of other individuals in order to increase his own and the institution's productive capacities. Um, I did say that he constantly asked you to do things. I didn't say he asked you to do silly or foolish things. I didn't even say that he asked you to do things that redounded to his benefit or to that of the public at large to the cost of yourself. The real genius about Mark and the ability to do this particular thing well is every time you ask for a favor, it turns out it's a very good guy idea for you to do. So what happens is he has mastered the art of eliciting cooperation by generating mutual gains for the people who happen to be on his radar scheme at any given time. And I think if we did an FOM chart, the Friend of Mark chart, it would show an enormous amount of influence precisely because he's always in the position of asking people to do favors for him, which turn out to be favors for everybody else. And that's the multiplier effect. That's the kind of leverage that it has. Now, the question we then have to ask, and I have no idea how much time I'm supposed to speak, is how does this relate to the organization of the McLean Center? And that's an interesting question. I actually thought of the answer as I was tripping my way up the steps a moment ago, which is if you want to figure out what is distinctive about the McLean Center over the years, it has been the ability to have in a single room people who are drawn from all walks of life who would normally have no particular reason to talk to one another, but each of them has been inveigled by Mark in order to come to the meeting on the assumption that somebody else they'd like to talk to would come to the meeting as well. And so over the years, it's been really quite an extraordinary assemblage of individuals who flitted in and out of the center's life. And it seems to me that this is actually something which has immense importance. It certainly tells us a great deal about how the University of Chicago has been organized. For people who do not understand universities, uh, architecture is destiny. If you have a university which is reasonably close together, where people are constantly bumping into one another, these incidental contexts will translate themselves into academic collaborations, and the university will therefore be the home of interdisciplinary behavior, not because there is somebody at the top who's organizing this, but because there are a lot of little maestros like Mark organizing this thing from the bottom, so that essentially what we do is we show that decentralized institutions in the good Hayekian tradition, which is not the model and liberal tradition, Mr. Lantos, um, can outperform all of those command and control economies with respect to the way in which ideas and operations go. And, and I would think over the years, uh, Mark and I have probably collaborated on, I don't know, eight or 10 conferences. I think I must have given over there probably a workshop or two every year. The topics are a dizzying array of subjects. And the only qualification that I have to speak on any of them is a willingness to put my head underneath the guillotine and hope that I could talk fast enough so as the wind will keep the blade from falling down. Um, 
But that's exactly what you want to do inside a university. I, I think one of the really major flaws of the modern academic model, uh, which Mark is, I think, living proof of its unsoundness, is that we try to train people now to become deeper and deeper, which means they become narrow and narrow and more and more specialized. And so what they become is essentially much too much risk averse in the way in which they start to think about scholarship. It's okay, at least at a conference, to make a fool of yourself from time to time. Because if you don't take the sorts of chances with ideas that link together things that may or may not hold together, what's going to happen is you will get yourself into this kind of profile in which you're going to be an unleveraged academic person. You're not going to borrow. You're not going to take chances. You're always going to be safe. You'll never go bankrupt, and you'll never get rich. And in terms of a business, what we really want to do in universities is to encourage kind of risk-taking behavior by academics. And we are perfectly happy if they have 10 bad ideas which die and most deserve a death, so long as they can generate one idea which actually has some real traction and ability to it. Uh, what we do in life, as you sort of sum up the total of who contributed what at the end of the day, is that people who hit home runs are remembered, and people who sort of try to bunt their way onto first base are not. And what Mark has always been able to do is to encourage people to be free swingers. Now, how does this, in fact, apply when we're dealing with respect to medicine? I've now got a two-minute thing, and I will say it. Uh, what happens is it encourages people to sort of learn things outside of their field. One of the things that actually amazes and pleases and disappoints me all at once is that I have been involved not only with the McLean Center with respect to its workshops, but also in teaching the various fellows who come through each year in this number of summer programs. And what distresses me about the state of modern medical education in the United States is they spend too much time on medicine. And, and what I mean by that is if you're trying to figure out how a system of medicine fits into a system of, of health care, the knowledge of collateral disciplines becomes absolutely essential. And what happens is, to put it in the simplest possible terms, medicine is much too important to be left to doctors. Um, it's OK to let them treat patients on an individual basis. But when you're trying to put together systems and to develop incentive structures to deal with problems of moral hazard, adverse selection, trying to figure out on the margin how much you invest in specialists, how much you invest in generalists, how you put the whole ball of wax together, what you do with immigration policy, and so forth. What is so clear to me is that the standard form of medical education today does not give doctors the tools to handle these kinds of questions. But it often gives them the confidence to believe that they can. And, and the overconfidence coupled with the lack of information is, I think, an extremely dangerous and potent thing. What is useful about the center is that Mark is able to get large numbers of people from throughout the university fairly intensive fashion to talk about these issues to a group of people who actually seem to be receptive to learn about it. So my hope, in effect, is that there'll be less medical and less clinical in the ethics, and a little bit more by way of economics, a little bit more by way of moral theory, a little bit more by way of law and everything else. And in fact, that can be done. Uh, oftentimes, you have to understand what it is you need to know to do medical ethics as opposed to what it is you know to be a doctor. And I'm going to end on this note. I would never presume to be a physician because there are two things I can't do. One of them is procedures and the other is dosage. And everything else, it seems to me, doesn't really matter. Uh, but what you can do, in effect, is you can understand people telling you how a procedure is done and what the difficulties are. So that in many ways, when you're dealing with medical ethical problems, the things that you have to understand is that the stuff which is easiest to learn is the stuff which is internal to the medical discipline. And the stuff which is harder to learn is the collateral materials on decision theory and everything else under the sun, which you bring to bear in order to exercise it. So my sense of what the mission of the McLean Center is going forward, which I think is a very important, is to be very conscious about that level of integration. And as people become ever more meddlesome in the way in which they wish to argue for for healthcare, what we have to remember is that the good liberal of the 21st century, Dr. Lantos, is in fact the good liberal of the 19th century. Small government, wise decentralized institutions who respect property rights and so therefore end their speeches on time. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you for keeping everything in the simplest possible terms, Richard. <laughs> Next speaker, uh, Ed Lauman, has probably the greatest disparity between what his bio sketch says and what he actually does. He 
Cats Biosketch is, he's the George Herbert Mead Distinguished Service Professor of Sociology at the, in, uh, at the college. He's been Chair of Sociology, Dean of the Division of Social Sciences, Provost of the University, and currently directs the Ogburn Stouffer Center for Population and Social Organization. What he actually does is study sex and knows more about who's sleeping with whom in what positions in every country in the world than anybody else in the world. You've just heard a masterful extemporaneous speak, which was not misrepresenting himself, that he just did it on the fly. It was a, a wonderful uh, tour de force. I'm going to give you a, a potted speech, uh, which, because it gave me a chance to think about these things, and what's going to be amazing is how similar uh, we diagnose what his bark has been doing for the university and uh, the Center for Clinical Medic Medical Ethics. I very much appreciate this opportunity to make some informal remarks recalling Marx and my collaboration to help develop an interdisciplinary community of scholars at the university over the past 30 some years. This community is interested in clinical medical ethics and more broadly in interdisciplinary collaboration among the humanities, arts, social sciences, and medicine. Mark has obviously played an absolutely critical role uh, in fostering these developments at Chicago through his multifaceted talents, re relentless energy and drive, and remarkable skills as an intellectual leader, agenda setter, and networker extraordinaire. Perhaps not surprisingly, I first met Mark on a squash court uh, in the mid-70s, shortly after I arrived here. As you may know, Mark has had a, an enormous passion for the game, as I do, and it was almost inevitable that we would have found one another in that way. My professional interests in sociology have, from the beginning of my career, uh, been in the study of informal social networks uh, in all their guises, including friend and kid uh, ties, professional ties, uh, ties among community and national leaders, and sexual networks, in order to understand their role in facilitating the exchange of information, social support, social control, resources like money and favors, and pathogens. But in Mark, I found a true grandmaster of networking who had much to teach me by example and instruction on how to use networks to advance one's larger agenda. One need only look at the letterhead stationary of the Center for Medical Ethics that lists no less than 68 names drawn from the most diverse of institutional and intellectual pedigrees to make this point manifest. In fairly short order, Mark recruited me to be an assistant director in the Nason Center, and I found myself having to think of clinical medical ethics from the vantage point of the social sciences, a topic for which I had originally had no interest whatsoever, or perhaps more correctly put, had no conscious awareness of being an interest of mine. I was pressed to identify potential fellow travelers in the social sciences who could be recruited on a continuing basis to participate in biweekly symposia um, devoted to examining a year-long overarching theme. Mark is truly remarkable in his ability to elicit and formulate uh, cross-cutting interests and concerns across a diverse array of fields, including uh, usually themselves bunkered down in their respective uh, silos of intellectual preoccupations and concerns. I recall many a luncheon meeting at the Quad Club where a group of us were asked to wrestle with identifying a thematic uh, focus for the year's topic that would appeal to our respective uh, constituencies and then to identify uh, uh, who among our own faculty or from the national pool of intellectual leaders, those that should be invited to make presentations in the symposia. These meetings were themselves intellectually exhilarating because they involved discussing important topics with fascinating people whom you would never have met under normal circumstances of academic life. These get-togethers brought into contact such diverse thinkers as Stephen Tolman in the Committee on Social Thought and Philosophy, Richard Epstein, uh, Leon Cass, Richard Swader at Human Development, James Coleman in Sociology, Gene and John Komaroff in Anthropology, Arthur Rubenstein, Ralph Muller, 
uh, Robert Michael in Economic Demography in the NRC, John Lantos, William Meadow, uh, Sam Hellman, uh, Norman Bradburn, Laney Ross, uh, Eddie Lawler, Elizabeth Helsinger, who is in English Literature and Languages and Art History, and many more too numerous to mention in these brief remarks. Early in our revolving, evolving relationship, sometime in the early 80s, Mark and I found ourselves in a strategic alliance. The medical school had invited me as a social scientist and chair of the department uh, to participate in the selection of fellows for the highly competitive MSTP program, uh, the MD-PhD joint program. Apparently, uh, the powers that be were receiving pressure from NIH to open the program to persons who wanted to pursue PhDs in the non-hard sciences. As a newcomer to the selection committee, I was clueless about what was entailed in selecting the most promising candidates. Mark was, of course, quite familiar with the reigning protocols of, for selection. Together, we identified a candidate who, of all things, wanted to pursue a PhD in the Committee on Social Thought, a highly prestigious program that was notorious for its uh, lengthy time to completion and was a degree program as far afield from the pool of usual suspects in the medical school as could be imagined. Talk about pushing the envelope. We finally managed to persuade the selection committee on the merits of the candidate, and he went on to a distinguished career. He is Richard Gunderman, currently professor of radiology, pediatrics, medical education, philosophy, liberal arts, and philanthropy. Honestly, that is the title of his professorship. And vice chairman of radiology and director of pediatric radiology at Indiana University School of Medicine. In 19, uh, a final war story. In 1985, I was appointed dean of the social science division. Because of these collaborations with Mark and the center, I'd become much more interested in encouraging the formation of more social and intellectual ties across different units of the university, and particularly the medical school. In the spring of 1986, Mark and I began to discuss the planning for a year-long workshop on AIDS and society that would bring together social science and medical school faculty to discuss the diverse challenges arising from an epidemic that was at the time doubling every 10 months. In the course of a riveting series of talks presented by leading authorities from such diverse backgrounds as the chief of a principal AIDS ward in San Francisco, an ethicist from the Hastings Institute, key section chiefs uh, supporting AIDS research at the NIH, deans of schools of public health, health policy specialists, and so on, I became convinced that there was not going to be any time soon a magic bullet that would stop the spread of the epidemic through immunization. The answer appeared to lie in behavioral interventions, and here we lacked critical information on the, semi, uh, the sexual practices and attitudes of the population at large that might be placing us all in jeopardy. Robert Mackle, an economic demographer and director of NRC at the time, and I began to talk and soon concluded that Chicago should undertake another Manhattan project, which would pool our strengths in survey and sample design at NRC to mount a national survey of sexual practices. There's no question that the scope and ambition of this project and its capacity to tap rich interdisciplinarily based empirical and theoretical resources and personnel is deeply indebted to the community of scholars that was fostered by these workshops over a number of years. It simply could not have happened without this foundation. As a sociologist, I would identify some key elements of this cross-cutting institution for which Mark has provided the critical leadership. He succeeded in fashioning a common intellectual focus and agenda that engages and stimulates the interests of those rooted in diverse disciplines and intellectual preoccupations. He has been extraordinarily successful in finding topics that grab the attention and commitment of a core group of participants over long periods of time. He created an environment, the bi-weekly luncheon meetings, that permitted busy people to come together in an informal, socially supportive environment. For example, he fed us and let us become acquainted with our neighbors in a natural, unforced, unforced way. He created social sanctions, repeated reminders, personal and by email, to pester backsliders that were not coming regularly. In short, he proved to be a nudge, nag, and badgerer that helped to overcome the usual friction incurred by attendance when you have other things to do. For all these things, Mark, we are in your debt. Uh, 
Uh, we were all sad when Eddie Lawler left the University of Chicago to become the Dean of the School of Social Work at Wash U in 2004, but we understood the reason why. His daughter Abby, one of the finest stoppers to ever play for the Hyde Park Red Dogs, was being recruited uh, uh, to, a, to the better leagues in St. Louis, and so they had to find a job for Eddie down there. Uh, before that, he was Dean of the School of Social Service Administration here, the uh, uh, professor in the Irving B. Harris School of Policy Studies and a senior scholar at the McLean Center, and I worked with Eddie a lot as core faculty member of the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Scholars Program. He's one of the leading national scholars on Medicare policy and the history of uh, the evolution of the Medicare program. Eddie. So good morning, Mark. I had no idea that this picture would be this big. <laughs> I confess it's genuinely Orwellian looking down on us uh, from this. Well, we've been asked to talk a little bit about um, the McLean Center as part of the University of Chicago, and I thought I would just say a few words, uh, both from a personal uh, perspective on this and, and through an institutional lens. I arrived as a new assistant professor in 1984 uh, at the university, and quite immediately, Mark uh, took me out to lunch. Uh, and this is, I, I think, uh, interesting in its own right, because at the time I was not doing uh, health policy work. I just uh, finished uh, graduate school working on labor market behavior of old men, uh, but I'd actually been trained in health policy, and Mark somehow knew this and, uh, and took me out, which was unusual, uh, I will say, as a new assistant professor upon arrival. <laughs> And he had many ideas. He had many ideas about things, uh, not only that I could do, uh, but also uh, uh, ways that we could work together. We talked about teaching. Uh, he made available um, rounds for me to uh, observe and attend, uh, the opportunity to work with fellows, um, to present at workshops. It was an extraordinary uh, thing for, as I say, for a new assistant professor on this campus. And that uh, generous outreach uh, really launched a whole program of work for me, and as Ed described, a, a set of relationships uh, uh, that have been unparalleled, actually, in, in my life. In the midst of that, uh, Mark was particularly interested in the connections between ethics and policy. Uh, and in fact, we ended up uh, teaching a seminar uh, together and, uh, with John Lantos and others uh, over several years that drew students from all over the campus uh, to work in this area. I too have been struggling, as uh, uh, Richard and Ed have, to sort of quite capture uh, the, the imagery of, uh, of this center. And the best uh, example I could come up with is Mark's world, um, which is, I think of as quite analogous to Wayne's world, um, uh, although the academic version of it. So, in Wayne's world and Saturday Night Live is it has its own uh, reality in some ways and its own community of people. And in the early years, actually I think John would call this uh, Sig's world if I remember correctly, uh, that this was, uh, as Ed Lauman described, uh, a collection of extraordinarily talented, interesting, uh, and academically diverse individuals uh, who came across uh, uh, to have lunch together, to have seminars, and, and the uh, discussions were unusual uh, and extraordinary. I thought I would tell one story about this, because in the midst of this, uh, and, and as we built these thematic approaches year to year, one year uh, Mark uh, uh, developed this theme in which we would try to come up with empirical understandings of the doctor-patient relationship and uh, work groups were assembled, very interesting, small clusters of faculty uh, to work on uh, and to try to think through how you would actually measure uh, and estimate uh, the value of the doctor-patient relationship. And there was, I uh, was in a small group um, uh, of economists and others trying to sort of think through uh, what's the economic value of the doctor-patient relationship. And so this is just to give you a sense of the theater of Mark's world. Uh, we met uh, at 6.30 in the morning uh, in uh, Mike Roizen's office. Um, and those of you who uh, know Mike will probably appreciate this story more. Uh, Mike at the time was the 
uh, the head of critical care and anesthesiology, and in the midst at 6.30, and we had Bob Michael was there, and David Dranoff, and Michael Cadding, just a terrific group. And Mike has, ca you know, just cases rolling in uh, that he's managing uh, on the floor. He also has his broker uh, who is calling up and he's doing a ferocious amount of trading uh, in the middle of this meeting. And uh, in the middle of it, not in the middle of it, 15 minutes, he jumps up with great fanfare and says he's been measuring, uh, I'll never forget this, he's been measuring and monitoring his caffeine intake uh, in the morning. And uh, he has exceeded uh, doses of caffeine that any uh, human should be able to, uh, uh, to absorb uh, at that early. And it was just a, a fantastic, uh, uh, not only intellectual experience, but also uh, some great fun. Part of the, uh, I, I think part of the uh, genius of this interdisciplinary uh, approach is that I, I, I've come to believe that Mark uh, was also great at marketing, something that not uh, everybody has uh, mentioned this morning. And I'll give you one example of this. This was a seminar that I gave in 1986 uh, at the center, and I thought the title was over the top. Uh, this was the Winds of Creative Destruction. Uh, hospital closures in Chicago, uh, but Mark loved this title. He was like gleeful. He was jumping up and he thought this was great. Uh, this is what we should do. Uh, and in fact, uh, I had a, it was a, and this was a time uh, in, the, in the marketplace when DRGs had come in, uh, hospitals were closing in Chicago, there was uh, uh, the Michael Reese University of Chicago merger discussions were afoot, there was uh, uh, also um, uh, the Cook County Hospital affair. And, and so I, again, I treat this as an opportunity, I had a chance to give this seminar, I actually got uh, some terrific comments uh, that I still remember well. Uh, from Ed Lauman as a course of this. But this was, all, I think, f it's, it's a piece of the puzzle that Mark not only assembled the right people, but he communicated and marketed this work uh, in an extraordinarily effective way. I had the chance to uh, work directly, uh, in, in the, particularly in those early years, with a whole set of uh, colleagues, uh, and, and this wasn't just uh, seminars. So, I thought I would just uh, point out a couple of uh, papers that uh, resulted from these meetings uh, in my own life. Uh, this is John Lopuma, uh, and, and this was a paper we did uh, for JAMA. Uh, I'll get to this in a second, Richard. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and this was a, so, so John and I worked on um, a paper on qualities, quality adjusted life years, and it was one of those exchanges that I think is at the heart of this center. Uh, we learned a great deal from each other, we argued, we fought, and uh, eventually uh, put together, uh, I think, a, a, a pretty interesting piece of work, which is an exemplar, or I would like to think of it as an exemplar of this kind of uh, collaboration, which was a paper directed at uh, the ethical implications for physicians and policymakers. And I think neither of us individually would have been able to go down that trail uh, effectively. Uh, Richard mentioned uh, these, these seminars, and I was uh, the beneficiary of sitting through many of his uh, and, uh, and, and learned a great deal from all this. And actually, it's, uh, I have a, a line, a lead into a chapter in my Medicare book, uh, which really is a direct result um, uh, from, from those days and uh, of, of hearing Richard uh, in various guises talking about the, the dangers of moral hazard in our, in our system. Also got to do some teaching, and I think this is an important uh, part of the history of this, uh, with some great colleagues, uh, with Laney and, and John uh, and Steve Miles. Steve Miles and I taught a course over several years on uh, ethics and policy uh, in AIDS. Uh, again, at a time uh, in the early part of the epidemic, we actually had truth squads in our class uh, from the university uh, students to make sure that we didn't say anything uh, 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 politically incorrect or uh, uh, untoward, and it was a really exciting and interesting uh, seminar that again draws students from the law school, from medicine, from social work, and from policy. And I think this was a, uh, in my mind, this also was a layer uh, of the center's contribution in creating uh, interdisciplinary work uh, that's, that's quite important. So I hope I've conveyed uh, a little bit of what a special place this kind of Marx world uh, is, uh, particularly 
uh, for me as a relative outsider, uh, somebody who's not a clinician, uh, somebody with no appointment uh, to speak of in the medical school or any of the surrounding areas, but uh, for whom in my professional and academic career this was an extraordinary resource and, and I learned so much. Uh, there's a, I wanted to close with um, really picking up on uh, a couple of comments that Stan Goldblatt made uh, last night um, and, and just uh, uh, push or prod a little bit about the future uh, of this great place. Uh, Tom Schelling has this, he used to give this talk, Tom Schelling is the uh, Nobel Prize winning game theorist, has this talk about uh, the incredible shrinking faculty seminar. Uh, and it's actually a, it's a, a piece of game theory and, and it's, it, it works through kind of the logical decline of any uh, particularly uh, interdisciplinary group of this sort uh, over time. And part of, I think, the power of this center is it's tilted against some natural forces uh, in the academy for this to dissipate uh, over time. And I think in the future, uh, there's gonna, there will be this continuing challenge uh, to really make this the kind of exciting uh, 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 interdisciplinary uh, environment that, that I experienced here. So I hope uh, on my personal wish list is that uh, as we think ahead uh, that this uh, center and this work continues to look outward, uh, continues uh, not to be safe, uh, and I think certainly uh, to take advantage uh, of the amazing social science and policy uh, resources that uh, sit here uh, on this campus. This is an incredible moment, I think, for uh, this field and, and for ethics. Uh, this will be a period uh, of renewed uh, discussion and debate about healthcare reform. I think there are gonna be some fantastic and hard questions uh, that really get to the heart of the uh, doctor-patient relationship. This is gonna be a period where Genetics and personalized medicine, I think, raise uh, new and important questions in this field. I think the, the era of translational science has uh, huge implications for how we think about uh, clinical ethics uh, and policy. And on my personal wish list, and even thinking through the presentations yesterday, I hope and, and trust the center uh, will also look outwards into the community uh, and to think about the doctor-patient relationship as extending uh, uh, into uh, neighborhoods and, and, and the health behavior that is, uh, we think, 40% uh, or so of the overall action in epidemiology. So Mark, congratulations. It's really been a wonderful uh, world you've created, both for me and for our institution, and I thank you for that. And we can't let this distinguished panel go without giving you an opportunity to pepper them with your questions. Please make your questions brief, but don't be afraid to speak really, really fast. Should I ask a question? Yes. <laughs> go ahead. I, have, yeah, I mean, I, I do want to ask the question, which I think is extremely important um, for the doctors around here. Um, my sense about the medical curriculum, looked at from the outside, speaking about the kinds of issues that you have today, is that to some extent it has not kept pace with the times. Um, there was a time when medicine was concerned, as, it, as I said earlier, with the actual care and treatment of patients in individual cases, and you didn't have to worry about larger institutional structures and arrangements. And what always troubles me when I go to large numbers of meetings, for example, where you talk about things like universal health care and similar topics, is that I think of them as very complex social systems. I'm very worried about how you run, know something about the fundamentals of insurance before you try to nationalize it, know something about uh, what economists have called the theory of public choice. And I could recall mentioning the phrase at uh, several of the sessions that we had and that there's not a single doctor in the room who actually knew what it meant. Um, and I dare say most people here don't, which is a theory of how it is that self-interested individuals respond not in market environments where competitive forces may keep them in line, but in political environments where coalitions can engage in winner-take-all types of behavior such that if you get a coalition with 51% of the votes and can dictate the agenda, you may be able to commandeer 100% of the resources unless you're subject to some kind of counter pressure by either constitutional constraints or by sort of internal house rules and so forth. And it seems to me that when trying to figure out what doctors are doing today, so much of the time 
we spill over from ethics as physician-patient relationships to ethics as kind of structural entitlement types of issues. And it is troubling to me, I think, that uh, the kinds of tools that we try to bring to bear on that in, in law and in the social sciences are often missing in the standard medical curriculum so that when you have people who come into the clinical medical ethics program, the Robert Wood Johnson program, whatever it is that we're running, uh, these concepts are not familiar to them. I think it's an enormously valuable thing and that this program actually tries to force feed this information, but the question that I have for the medical profession at large is why do you have to have this kind of education only for a select number of individuals when in fact doctors seem to spend an enormous amount of time and are given an enormous amount of deference when they start to work and deal in these particular areas. I mean, just to be a little bit personal about it, I can't think of any more uninformed source of information about policy on medical care and pharmaceutical care and so forth than the New England Journal of Medicine. I'm told that the medicine in there is pretty good, but the economics and the law that you see in there, as far as I'm concerned, is cheerleading of the worst order. And, and the same thing I... From Joel Howell, well, I'm, I'm going to just say it. I mean, you know, and the same thing I think is in many cases true of the, of the AMA in the journal is that one sees in these things very sharp political agendas in which aspirations count for everything and, and, and limitations on technologies and scarcity seem to count for nothing. Um, it's just this endless cornucopia of entitlements um, for which there seems to be no effective counterweight. And I think we will see in healthcare the kinds of implosions we'll see everywhere else, and I think a large part of the blame lies on the medical profession, which tries to talk about these issues in ways that I don't think reflect the sort of fundamental difficulties associated with scarcity and with the corruptibility of political institutions. I mean, it's not that you don't want to do nice things, but you always have to worry about the fact that they not be done. And uh, I think that, to me, in medical education, is the fundamental question. How much of a mix of medical with respect to the social is going to be involved, given the fact that the politicization, by which I don't mean negative sense, but just the ability of the health care issue to become a fundamental portion of national and state politics today. I think it's too important to have this left a sort of haphazard understanding, and I think a much more detailed form of social sciences. Now, Arthur's not here to defend the medical profession, um, but you know, I'd like to see whether my co-panelists think that this is just some white wing crank talking about it, or whether or not there's actually some serious problem here, even for those people who are trying to design institutions which do have an extremely difficult task, which is to open up access under a set of circumstances where you don't create simply impossible demands upon a system which will die under its own weight. Um, running a system of redistribution is not an easy task, to put it mildly, and it takes a great deal of sophistication to do it, and you can't get that by simply dealing with exuberance. And this seems to me to be one of the sort of the fundamental problems that I associate um, with the entire profession. And okay, okay, okay. Joel, <laughs> take a breath. No, and that I think somebody ought to comment on it. Go ahead, Joel. Or most, of, or most of what you commented on. Um, I do want to defend the system of medical education. And I just want to say that if you believe that really nothing of importance has changed since about 1920, uh, then we have a system of medical education that makes enormous sense. Um, I think the main problem with the system is simply that it's petrified, it's ossified. It was created in 1920 and and I know there are people in the room who will tell me about all the radical changes that have been made in the curriculum, but I would say that in terms of true fundam truly fundamentally rethinking the role of physicians in the profession, it has not changed appreciably. And if we want it to change, we need to start from scratch, which is unlikely to happen, so there's a hopeless comment. Is Holly, <laughs> is Holly out here, or Helena? There is a big curricular reform effort going on here, but go ahead, Dr. Binning. Well, I actually think that uh, much of the problem with medical education starts before they get to medical school. Uh, if you think about uh, our selection criteria, it's how well do you um, go to lectures, take tests, get grades. And uh, if you're going to start having the, us in our profession think about these issues uh, seriously, it's too late if you wait till medical school. <coughs> medical school should be an extension uh, and should build on what you learned uh, before you got there. Uh, the, and, and of course, um, 
even in the new curriculum that uh, people are developing, uh, the students still know that the uh, currency is uh, going to class, t going to lecture and taking tests. Uh, and when you do things like try and implement curricula that uh, is broader, uh, half the students don't show up. Uh, if they do show up, they're only doing it because they feel a little guilty. Uh, and, uh, and so I think we need to have a discussion about how do we select the students for medical school and how could we lead a change that would result in different criteria and rather than just having uh, a few sciences uh, as the pre-medical requirement that we, we made a much bigger uh, look and made uh, some basic decisions. Thanks. I think we are going to um, move on to the next panel, but let's thank this panel for <laughs> some Uh, but first, Dan Salmezi is going to give his talk. I first met Dan at a bioethics summer camp where we had the opportunity to go hiking in the mountains of, I think, New Mexico. And uh, we had a great chat, Dan and Jay Jacobson and myself, and we were talking about medical ethics and autonomy and healthcare rationing. But Dan also knew the names of most of the wildflowers we saw along the way. And I was pretty impressed. He's a Franciscan friar. Uh, a, a, an internist, he's professor of medicine and directs, director of the Bioethics Institute of New York Medical College in Valhalla, New York. He got his uh, BA and MD from Cornell and a PhD in philosophy from Georgetown, and he was appointed by Governor Pataki to the New York State Task Force on Life and the Law in 2005. He's also editor-in-chief of the journal Theoretical Medicine and Bioethics. Yeah. Thanks. I, uh, I, I join the, uh, the legions uh, here expressing what an honor it really is to, uh, to be here uh, celebrating all that uh, Mark Siegler has done for the, for the field of, uh, of medical, uh, medical ethics. And among the papers I was uh, asked to, to talk about, um, the first one um, is, is this one, uh, Confidentiality in Medicine, a Decrepit Concept. We heard a little bit about it uh, yesterday. It was, uh, it was actually published while I was an intern. Um, at that time, we were calling the New England Journal of Medicine the Brown Journal because it came in brown paper and we never actually had the time to open it and read it. Um, but I did read, uh, read this article and actually wound up subsequently as a chief resident um, uh, uh, copying it and handing it out as part of the education program that I initiated in ethics for our, uh, for our house officers. Um, I actually I had the opportunity to, uh, to meet, uh, meet Mark as a, as a resident in about 1985, I, I, I think it was, and somebody who was interested perhaps in going into the field of medical ethics, I went to his lecture and talked, uh, talked to him, and I, I'm coming over the course of the last uh, day and a half or so to realize that I thought this was a, you know, accepted that there was a field already. I didn't realize that I was actually talking to somebody who was, uh, who was just beginning uh, this, this field. And I asked him what I should do, and he gave the advice I think he gives everybody. He said, come to Chicago. <laughs> Um, I didn't take his ad advice. I went to uh, I went to Georgetown, <laughs> uh, where I, I had the opportunity to study with uh, with Edmund uh, Edmund Pellegrino, which was um, uh, uh, truly an, an important um, uh, thing for me and um, and um, in my development as a, as a philosopher and ethicist. I owe, uh, owe a great deal to uh, to Dr. Pellegrino, um, but you know Mark has his uh, uh, has his persistence, and perhaps I'm a slow learner, um, and uh, and this may yet change. So. The second paper um, that was in the, uh, in the packet is the one I'm going to uh, concentrate uh, on, though. Uh, this one called uh, Contrib uh, The Contributions of Clinical uh, Ethics to, uh, uh, to, patient, uh, to Patient Care. Um, and in it, um, uh, really, um, Mark has raised a complaint that a lot of people uh, have, and that's that when we think about medical ethics, um, this is the way it's typically thought about, the way it's typically uh, taught, the way it, uh, it typically rolls out, um, even in clinical uh, settings. And that's that we start with um, our grand uh, theory or set of theories, and from these, um, 
Uh, we can derive general ethical principles of some sort, even if our theories disagree, we might be able to converge on these principles. We then specify them in terms of rules regarding clinical care, research, uh, the organizational structure of healthcare, and the socioeconomic and political um, uh, environment in which uh, healthcare is delivered. And then we further specify these into the rules uh, which govern um, um, patient care, um, our research protocols, uh, policies and procedures of hospitals and other institutions, and then, uh, and then public policy. Policy. Well, Mark thought there was something wrong uh, with that picture, and, um, uh, and in fact, I uh, agree. Um, um, and to sort of explain why, I'm going to start with um, a pair of distinctions uh, for you. Uh, one, uh, for those of you who studied any formal philosophy, will recognize the distinction between morality and ethics. And then, second, a distinction between common sense reasoning or practical reasoning or phrenesis um, versus scientific uh, reasoning. Um, the words are used uh, quite synonymously in, in ordinary language, but from a technical point of view, uh, when, we th uh, when a philosopher thinks about uh, ethics and morality, we think of them as distinct. That morality is really in some ways the some sphere of activities that we think are worthy of praise um, uh, or blame. It would include, for instance, in medicine, our codes, those sorts of things that are um, unreflective in the way in which we act. Um, and uh, ethics, though, um, is, if you will, a lens um, on that. It's the systematic study um, of morality, um, looking at it critically, uh, trying to, uh, to look for justifiable answers to the questions, if you will, the science um, of morality. So um, this is, so morality is, um, is the subject, um, ethics is really the, uh, the discipline for studying that, uh, that subject. The second distinction is between common sense uh, reasoning and science. Um, and this will make uh, hopefully a little bit more sense to you as the talk goes on. But whenever we do something scientifically, what we're really uh, uh, doing is talking about the universe, right? We're talking about um, um, everything that we can, uh, can comprehend within, uh, within that universe, whether it's the universe of patients, um, whether it's uh, the physical universe itself, whether it's the biological universe. And what you're doing in a scientific endeavor really is, is relating data to each other. Um, in a sort of abstract way. Um, a common example from this is phy in physics is, you know, force equals mass times acceleration, at least in, at Newtonian speeds. Um, that's, uh, that's a rule that in which we're relating the data uh, to each other. Um, common sense reasoning um, um, is different. Common sense reasoning is about particulars. It's not about what is true in general, but what is true here and now in this particular uh, s uh, state. Um, and, and what we're doing in many ways is relating the data not to each other, but to us um, as, as individuals. So while it may be true that F equals uh, MA, uh, the question that the orthopedic surgeon asks in the emergency room is, how much force does it take for me to reduce this dislocated shoulder so that it comes back um, in, in, into place appropriately? Okay? It's important to distinguish these two, and we uh, uh, confuse, them, uh, confuse them all the time. Um, Aristotle wasn't so confused. Um, um, in the Metaphysics, he writes this, the doctor does not treat man except accidentally. He treats Callias or Socrates or someone else described this way who is accidentally man. So if someone has grasped the principles of the subject without having any experience and thus knows the universal without knowing the individuals contained in it, he will often fail in his treatment for it is the individual who has to be treated. If we didn't get it from the metaphysics, Aristotle sort of repeats the same argument in the Nicomachean Ethics, um, where he's actually talking about, interestingly, the convergence of, uh, of clinical ethics with uh, the practice of medicine. He's using the practice of the doctor to talk about moral reasoning, to talk about his ethical view of, the, of moral reasoning. And he says this, for what the doctor appears to consider is not even health universally, let alone good universally, but human beings' health, and even more particularly than that, presumably this human being's health, since it is particular patients that he treats. Okay? 
So, what I want to contend at the very beginning then is that clinical medicine is a common sense practice, right? It is a common, it's relating the data to, to us, to individuals. It's a common sense practice. But a practice that doesn't occur in a vacuum, it's undergirded by biomedical research, it occurs in an organizational structure, and within social, economic, religious, and political structures um, as well. So I think the picture looks actually more like this, okay? That this is the field we're interested in. Um, um, in the end, um, it's about the particular patient, the individual practitioner or team of, of practitioners um, and the patient. Um, but we know that there are social conditions to that practice, that it occurs in organizations, there are research that inform our clinical uh, care um, uh, toward the patient. And what um, we're doing, I think, in medical ethics, actually, um, is studying this field. Um, I think it can't be divorced from, uh, uh, from actually um, uh, the philosophy of medicine, and please understand these writ large. I don't want to exclude um, any other, other professions. But it's the systematic study of this field um, that we're about. And so, I want to present in the next few minutes for you something I'm calling the Tractatus Philosophico Medico Moralis, um, or what Mark Siegler would say um, if he had uh, studied a little too much uh, uh, Wittgenstein, or maybe what I'm saying is that Mark Siegler should read some Wittgenstein, and if he did, um, what, he would actually, what he would actually say. And these may uh, uh, be bold enough in a Wittgensteinian way to uh, um, encourage some discussion. I think we'll have, uh, hopefully, some, uh, some time for that. So here's, here's the Tractatus. Clinical ethics is a branch of the philosophy of medicine. The philosophy of medicine is the philosophy of a scientifically informed common sense practice. The philosophy of medicine is not a branch of the philosophy of science because medicine itself is not a science. The philosophy of medicine informed, the philosophy of science informs the philosophy of medicine because medicine is a scientifically informed practice. While clinical ethics is properly considered a part of the philosophy of medicine, clinical ethics is of necessity informed by general ethical theory. Clinical ethics is not the application of general ethical theory to clinical practice. All attempts to apply general ethical theory to clinical practice must assume a philosophy of medicine, at least implicitly, whether or not that philosophy of medicine is insightful or correct. Many mistakes in clinical ethics are traceable to a lack of attention to the underlying philosophy of medicine. Medical ethics, though, as we know, is both a field of scholarly inquiry and a practice. As a field of scholarly inquiry, that is, as a science, it is open to the insights of many disciplines. Medical ethics is not a discipline per se, but a field of study to which many disciplines contribute. These disciplines include, but are not limited to, philosophy, law, theology, sociology, economics, health services, research, history, and others. Normative medical ethics is the systematic, critical, reasoned evaluation and justification of judgments about right and wrong, good and evil in medical practice, and of the kinds of persons clinicians ought to become. Descriptive medical ethics is the use of empirical methods to study and explain the beliefs, attitudes, and behaviors of patients, practitioners, and others in medical situations of normative interest, of the data needed to answer such questions well, 
and of the associated factors and effects of policy and education about normatively interesting questions in medical care. Metaethics, by contrast, is the systematic critical reason study and justification of fundamental questions about moral reasoning, language, and knowledge. Metaethics informs medical theory, that in turn informs medical ethics, but metaethics is not a part of medical ethics per se. Medical research ethics is the study of the morality of biomedical research. Medical organizational ethics is the study of the morality of local healthcare delivery systems or networks of such systems. And the social ethics of medicine is the study of the morality of healthcare systems in relationship to the social, cultural, legal, political, economic, and religious aspects of the societies in which medicine is practiced. Clinical ethics research is the study of the morality of clinical practice. The central concern of all medical ethics is the set of all normative questions concerning clinical practice. The importance of all other subjects of scholarly inquiry in medical ethics is derivative, dependent upon our concerns regarding normative clinical questions. To the extent that the ultimate concern of a scholarly endeavor is not a clinical question of normative interest, that endeavor is not medical ethics. But clinical ethics is also a practice, a common sense enterprise. Clinical ethics consultation is a common sense practice that is informed by the study of medical ethics, just as clinical medicine is a common sense practice informed by medical science. Clinical ethics practice is also concerned with clinical policy development, and clinical ethics as a praxis is also concerned with teaching clinicians about how to address norm, uh, clinical questions of normative concern. So that's my uh, analytic uh, reconstruction of Mark Siegler's uh, uh, philosophy of medicine. But what I want to end with is saying this, that I think Mark understood early on that many of the most pressing moral questions which we face in our healthcare system today are engendered by our abstraction from the patient. And I'll sort of illustrate this for you. Many of you are probably familiar with this painting by uh, Luke Fills, his painting uh, of the doctor. And I want you to pay attention to the clinic, what I call the clinical gaze, right? The doctor, his attention is focused on the patient. This is 1891, and people were saying this all changed in the 60s. Um, I think the seeds of this started much earlier. Here's the next, uh, the next uh, uh, painting just a few years after this. Do any of you know who the artist is on this? Picasso. This is actually Picasso, that's correct. Before he started abstracting, he did uh, Ciencia y Caridad. But notice the clinical gaze in this picture. The doctor may have his hand on the patient's pulse. The doctor is looking at his watch. Um, and there's a divorce in this painting between the caring aspects, which are done by the nurse or sister, and the technical aspects, which are already being done um, by the physician. A central task for medical ethics is to keep our focus, even as we pay attention to all the other um, complicated social, economic, political, and technical and scientific aspects of delivery of care, to keep our focus um, on the patient. Because it gets even worse, this was, uh, I picked this up from an artist in uh, Helsinki at the European Society for Philosophy of uh, Medicine meeting, uh, where she uh, did this, she was just observing. She just went into the wards and observed what happened and, and did drawings. Um, but notice here, where's the gaze of the technician? Where is even the gaze of the pregnant woman? Right? They're both on the monitor, not on the patient. I think Mark Siegler has repeatedly reminded us throughout his career 
um, that we need to keep our eyes focused um, on the patient, um, both to do better medicine, and certainly that's the main task perhaps for medical ethics. And he also, I think, has repeatedly said that we have a very good role model for learning uh, how to do this, uh, and that's William Osler. Um, but somebody else is going to talk about Siegler and Osler uh, later this afternoon. Thank you. We'll have an opportunity to ask uh, Dan some questions afterwards. This next uh, introduction is complicated, so pay attention. <laughs> Jim Childress could not make it. Al Johnson could not make it. Al Johnson was supposed to present a paper this afternoon. He sent his paper in. We're moving Al Johnson's paper to the current session, but because Al is not here, it's going to be read by Father John Paris. You got that? <laughs> So I will introduce both of them. Al Johnson, um, by some quirk of the publishing industry, is actually the first author of Mark Siegler's book, Clinical Ethics. <laughs> uh, he's Professor Emeritus of Ethics at the University of Washington, was chair of the Department of History and Ethics, Medical History and Ethics at the University of Washington for about 15 years. He also served on the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects of Biomedical and Behavioral Research, the first uh, big national commission from 1977 to 1981. He's currently a visiting scholar at Stanford. Father John Paris is one of the leading scholars in bioethics in the country, particularly interested in end-of-life care issues. He's written extensively in most medical and bioethics journals and has also been an expert witness in many of the key end-of-life legal cases uh, over the last uh, 20 years. It will be fascinating to see whether Father Paris can stick to the text <laughs> since his usual approach, as you may know, is to get out in the audience and uh, extemporaneize. It will be also be interesting to see whether he takes questions as himself or as Al Johnson. <laughs> unaccustomed as I am to public speaking, and certainly unaccustomed to having a text in my hand. I don't think in 20 years I've read a paper to anybody or anything. In fact, I think the last paper I read was with Mark Siegler in the audience uh, in New Orleans. This is how I met Mark Siegler. We met as combatants. He wrote an article called Against the Emerging Stream on Nutrition and Fluid. This is a hopelessly bad idea. I was presenting a paper to the AMA in favor of it. Mark's at the back of the room, the very end of the room, uh, crowded room there. And at the end of this, he said, you know, you and I can make a living debating this around the country. And I've got two daughters at Yale, so we better go to work. <laughs> so we began this practice. We went around. And after three or four of these debates, Mark came up with the question that he always poses to everyone, why don't you come to Chicago? <laughs> that was 20 years ago, and I came for 50, every other year for 15 years, and I was quite pleased uh, to note at this conference, this was the first conference in 20 years that I wasn't going to give a paper. <laughs> so I didn't bring a tie, I came informally thinking, this, I can relax for the first time, so here I am as Al Johnson. Now, originally, I think it was going to be Dan, but they thought, A, he's not old enough, and B, not Jesuitical enough to read this paper. So they went to some old Jesuit. This paper is Al Johnson's reflections on his involvement with and experiences with Mark Siegel. And I'll read it just as he wrote it, he said. Uh, I thank Dan Silmazi, is what he wrote, for taking the podium to speak my words. I begin my remarks with a paraphrase of the words of another great Mark, Mark Anthony. I come not to praise Siegler, but to blame him. <laughs> but in blaming him, I also blame myself, Jim Childress, and most of the other old timers in bioethics. This is why Dan could not read this. My contention is that we made a big mistake, almost from the start of bioethics. And we should admit it, take the blame, and hope that the younger bioethicists will correct it. 
Bioethics began as a flurry of concerns about how technology was dominating the humane in the biomedical sciences in practice. As a flurry concentrated into a more disciplined inquiry into ethical problems posed within contemporary science and medicine, a search for some basic principles to set out the various harbors began. Moral philosophy, religious ethics, law, sociology, history of medicine. And those various strains converged on a particularly compelling problem, the use of humans as subjects in medical research. The Tuskegee revelations of the 1970s shocked the nation and recalled the evils of Auschwitz and Dachau. Congress initiated a regulatory process that would safeguard the rights and the welfare of human subjects. In its mandate, the National Commission for the Protection of Human Subjects ordered a commission to, quote, conduct a comprehensive investigation and study the identity and the basic ethical principles that should underlie the conduct of biomedical and behavioral research with human subjects. How rare a specimen, a congressional mandate to study ethical principles. Still, the commission obeyed, as best 12 persons, only two of whom, Karen Lebeck and myself, have studied moral philosophy could do. We engaged a distinguished academic moral philosopher, Stephen Toulman of the University of Chicago, to begin the comprehensive investigation. It turned out it wasn't easy to identify ethical principles. They can't be pulled out of an ethical grab bag. We enlisted a troop of academics to help us, including Jim Childress and Tom Beecham. Among these, Tris Engelhardt provided the commission with a paper that he stated, respect for human persons is a logical condition for morality, not a value among other values, but rather the basis of our sense of moral responsibility. He footnoted his remarks with a reference to Immanuel Kant. It so happened that my fellow commissioner, Lebeck, and I had recently read a book on Kant's ethics entitled Respect for Persons. When Kant used this concept as a fundamental notion for all ethics, he explained it involved the treatment of persons as ends and not merely as a means of utility for others. This appeared to the commissioners as a useful expression for a very basic idea about ethical research. This idea has been strongly defended by such fine philosophers as Hans Jonas in a seminal essay on ethics of research and by Jay Katz in his monumental book on research ethics. It is on reflection a patently clear ethical imperative for the work of research and the benefits of which derived from one party flow not to that party but to science and to society. The commissioners were quite happy with this formula. Respect for persons worked its way into a prime place in the Commission's Belmont Report, where it is said to incorporate at least two ethical convictions. First, that individuals should be treated as autonomous persons. And second, that persons with diminished autonomy are entitled to protection. Treating persons as autonomous meant giving weight to autonomous persons, considered opinions and choice while refraining from obstructing their actions unless they are clearly detrimental to others. The Belmont Report goes on to state that respect for persons requires that subjects be, quote, given the opportunity to choose what shall and shall not happen to them. This opportunity is provided when adequate standards for informed consent are satisfied. The lofty principle of respect for persons thus collapsed into informed consent. The Belmont Report is a monument of bioethics. The story of its making has been told in various ways, most lucidly and accurately, of course, in my own birth of bioethics. He learned from Siegler, this, this uh, Johnson boy. But its line of argument, though suitable as a statement of research ethics, began to lead bioethicists astray. First, the need to produce a document of public policy responsive to congressional mandate makes impossible serious philosophical reasoning. The Kantian thesis about respect is itself a huge intellectual edifice. Kantian scholars tremble before it. And so the commissioners, mostly untroubled by this philosophical intricacy and subtlety and desirous of simplicity and clarity, put Kantian complexity aside and slipped into the much simpler notion of liberty proposed by John Stuart Mill. 
person's choice of action should not be obstructed unless they interfere with the liberty of others. And here begins the blame for bioethics. Like Mark and myself, Bill Winslade, like Jim Childress and Tom Beecham, and many others. Childress and Beecham produced in their fine text The Principles of Biomedical Ethics in 1959, the same year the Belmont Report was issued. It's structured, 1979? Yeah. It's structured with some modifications, the principle of all bioethics around principles of research ethics, respect for autonomy, non-maleficence and beneficence, and justice. Jim had been a consultant to the commission. Tom has, had succeeded Toulman as its ethics advisor. Their quartet of principles became the standard throughout the growing world of biomedical scholarship. Two years later, in 1981, Mark Siegler, Bill Winslade, and I sat down in my San Francisco study to begin writing clinical ethics. We were motivated to produce a book that would be acceptable to, to clinicians by bringing principles down to practical application. We devised our framework of medical ind indications, patient's preference, quality of life, and contextual features. Although these features represented the empirical circumstances of clinical cases, they had to reflect ethical principles, lest our book be only a cheap sociological treatise. We naturally chose the quartet of Beecham and Childress. We did not discuss or defend these principles at length, but assumed each of their four principles stood behind each of our four empirical topics. We had all been misled. We had followed a twisted path from Kantian autonomy to Millsian liberty. Belmont had taken the first misstep, reducing Kantian autonomy to a definition of liberty, and then immediately linking this principle to informed consent. Beecham and Childress, being astute scholars of moral philosophy, knew and acknowledged the distinction between Kant and Mill, even proposing that they were following Kant's doctrine of self-legislation, but softening it into a position much closer to Mill. Johnson, Siegel, and Winslade made no effort to clarify these moves. And after affirming the patient preferences, reflects moral principles for respect for autonomy, quote, a moral attitude that inclines one to refrain from interference with another's beliefs or actions, they go immediately to the practice and problems of informed consent. So what's wrong? Is this not a philosophical picadillo? I believe it is much more. It established a line of argument that has harmed the way in which bioethics conceives of ethics of the patient-physician patient relationship. We not only read Kant too casually, we acceded with little evidence to the belief that the relationship was, and perhaps always had been, vitiated by the evil of paternalism. We were living in those days in a culture that had become strongly anti-authoritarian. The patient-physician relationship, many believed, was an adversarial one. Just as in research, we had to fend off the rapacious researching grasp of the body and blood of the subjects, so too in clinical ethics, we had to ward off the paternalistic physician seeking to enter the patient's body by usurping the patient's judgments and choices. Thus, we seized on a formulation of a broad ethical principle in order to refute that paternalism. By refuting it, by stating that it naturally was an adversarial contact between the patient and the doctor, patients were the new superiors who gave the orders and who called the shots. And that's why I blame Mark Siegler today. In his first edition of Clinical Ethics, we wrote, in a priority ordering, patients' preferences are the weightiest ethical category in the patient-physician encounter. Mark was unhappy with that formulation. He was uncomfortable with the adversarial view of the patient-physician relationship. He had a clinician's natural instinct that this relationship with patients was not at all adversarial. Like several pioneer bioethicist physicians, such as Ed Pellegrino and Eric Cassell, he knew that people came to him hurting and looking for help. That relationship had to be, from the start, collaborative. Yet as Mark argued with Bill Winslade and myself, he won some concessions, 
but it does not dislodge us from our autonomy stance. In subsequent editions, the priority order was abandoned, but patient preferences were still supported by an inadequate interpretation of the principle of respect for persons. A more adequate interpretation can be found within the pages of Kant himself. While Kant did speak of respect for autonomy, he meant something a world away from John Stuart Mill's liberty, the right to choose and to live as one chooses. For Kant, respect for the dignity of all humans who are capable of making themselves and others a universal law. His final formulation of the categorical imperative uses the now antiquated notion of, quote, a kingdom of ends. But antiquated as it is, it is most appropriate as an ethical principle for the establishment of the alliance of the patient and the physician. When humans treat each other as ends and not as means, there arises a systematic union of rational beings under common objective law that is a kingdom of ends. Doctor and patient, each with their own needs, desires, capabilities, must find those principles that allow them to coalesce into helping, healing, and an alliance to achieve a common goal, to become, if not a kingdom, at least a republic of ends. So I blame Mark Siegler for not fighting harder for his clinician's instincts in our collaboration. I blame myself for being too shallow in understanding the problem in the meaning of the great Prussian philosopher. I blame many of my early colleagues for failing to find a firmer ground for a collaborative healing relationship. Well, after all, what are friends for if not to pass around a little blame? Thank you for allowing my voice to be heard even when my body could not come. He stuck to the script. You'll tell your grandchildren about that one. It's a first. It's a first. Uh, questions or comments? Go ahead, Woody. Sorry. Oh. I, I was about to do this. <laughs> you want to come up on the. You want to come sit up here? Yeah. to teach us in his uh, four-step process for ethical analysis that medical indications preceded patient preferences. And so I've, I've grasped that and run with that. And um, many times uh, my colleagues have said, but the patient wants it. And I would say, but it's not going to help him. It's not medically indicated. The balance of burdens to benefits is such that we shouldn't do it. And uh, so I've stuck to the Siglerian approach on that. And Mark, I, I hope that leads into what you want to say. In, in, in fact, it says precisely what I was going to say. I just want to preface it by being outraged by, by Father Paris's uh, comments today. <laughs> uh, as you can imagine, they struck me to the core. <clears throat> and I now envision another set of financially remunerative debates around the country, <laughs> even though the kids are out of college. <laughs> Mark has his card ready. <laughs> but but what, what, what Al, I, I mean, I'm so, I, I'm so sad that, that Al Johnson's not with us. Uh, As you may know, uh, uh, he was struck by a car about um, a week or 10 days ago uh, crossing the street in San Francisco. Uh, thank goodness he's, he's physically all right, um, although he's been advised not to travel, and um, he, he, he seriously apologizes for, for his not being with us. What Al doesn't say is, is that, that we gathered in um, 80 or 81 in, in his San Francisco house. Is this mic working up there? Going in and out. Oh, let me try this. We, 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 gathered, we, we gathered in Al's house uh, in San Francisco, um, which overlooked, uh, as I remember, the bay. Uh, and and you, would leave, you would leave the house and go out to the roof of the house. 
and, and you would then climb an outside staircase of about 10 or 15 steps that, that took you to an airy, uh, a, a kind of, I mean, it was the strangest room. It was the room where Al did all of his research and scholarship. So it was separate from the house itself and the roof. And, and you really felt you were isolated because in a way you were. There was no telephone in the room and you overlooked the bay. And we sat there for two days, literally doing what, what Woody has just said, arguing over the order of the chapters of the book. What, what ought to be the sequence? Should autonomy and liberty uh, dominate uh, as chapter one, leading into a second chapter on, on beneficence? And, and as you know, we, we integrated beneficence and non-maleficence into a single category, which we always thought was, was intellectually reasonable. Um, and, and rather than drafting any portion of the book, we spent the better part of two days um, of our meeting arguing out that point. And um, um, I, I still, to this day, I still, I, I mean, there, there, there was no definitive turning point in the discussion, but I still, to this day, remember a case that I had dealt with, um, and these cases, Dan, are, are so important, a case that I had dealt with uh, a week or 10 days before before the meeting, um, here at the university, uh, I know I have colleagues in the back who look after many faculty members, and, and this will resonate with, 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 with them, not, not the individual, but, but, but the possibility. Um, one of these brilliant, young, uh, aggressive associate professors um, who ran marathons and um, uh, had a young wife and a couple of kids, uh, and who I had known for a few years, had, had staggered into my office looking, I mean, I had never seen him look so bad, because uh, he, as I say, he was healthy and vigorous. And I, I said, what has happened to you? And he said, well, I've hardly slept for two nights struggling with my decision. Uh, which also, <laughs> I said, well, and, you know, I, I thought he was thinking about a career change, uh, leaving the university. I, I said, and what was that decision? What were you struggling with? And he said, whether to accept surgery or radiation therapy. Now, as far as I knew, there was nothing wrong with him. And so this, this decision that he had struggled over for two nights, obviously had struggled over, uh, made little sense to me. A as the story unfolded, he, he went on to say that he had been coughing for, for the better part of a week. And indeed, in the last two or three days, his, um, his phlegm had become blood streaked. Um, and he had kind of made a series of leaps um, about his father, who had died of lung cancer, um, and the kind of treatment that his father had had. So he had self-diagnosed himself with lung cancer as a result of this blood streak sputum, and, and not only that, but he had stayed awake wrestling with which decision was best for him with his young family and his career and the like. I mean, I, I, you could imagine, all of you in the audience, uh, um, you, you wanted, I mean, it was risible, and yet, and yet it, was, it was very serious because he was, he was a man in anguish. But to step back and say, you know, uh, I, I, I don't want to break your train of thought, but, but you're the fourth person I've seen this morning with blood streak sputum. You know, there, there's a bad virus going around. I mean, everybody's got this bronchitis, uh, whether they had the flu shot or not. And, um, and I think you may be jumping the gun on self-diagnosis and needing either 
radiation therapy or or surgery for that matter. Ra rather, if, if you know, if, if you listen to me, let's just give this four or five days <laughs> and talk it over next week, and maybe get a little bit of sleep, and I think you'll be feeling better. I know it, it's a trivial type case and rather bizarre in its presentation, but somehow, somehow. It resonated with, with Al Johnson and Bill Winslade, who said, yeah, you know, it doesn't make sense in the medical context to assert the liberty claim or the autonomy claim or the anti-paternalism claim until there is at least some reasonable structure in which the decisional framework can be organized and, and, and a decision can be reached. It, it's, I mean, it is, not exactly the same as, you know, whether you're going to live uh, in this house or that house, uh, or this town or that town. It takes a certain kind, well, I know, even that, I mean, that takes a lot of background information also. Somehow, it was that case, for all its bizarre quality, that led to chapter one being the first chapter on beneficence, uh, prior to that powerful chapter two, and, and we're currently, uh, Al and Bill and I are drafting the seventh edition. Um, we're halfway through almost. Um, and, um, and obviously we'll take very seriously what Al said, those outrageous remarks you <laughs> delivered, John, <laughs> so that you and I can. Stop it. Richard? That one's not hooked up to. Oh, it doesn't record. I'd like to get some, some opinions on the relationship of the key concepts that were put into the Belmont report, because I've always thought that it was the book of Job taken in the modern form, the Lord giveth, the Lord taketh away, blessed be the name of the Lord, in the sense that first you give autonomy, then you announce that autonomy doesn't go with people who have limited competence, then you conclude that all people have limited competence, then you include that autonomy essentially has to be handed over to an institutional review board of one kind or another. And I'm just curious, is this an unfair characterization of the way things work, or is it in fact have some resemblance of truth uh, in the way in which Johnson. one would want to evaluate the subject? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'd simply say it's an unfair characterization of how things actually work. Does any, anybody want to? No, I, I do think Johnson is correct in as much as the emphasis on, on autonomy gives this false understanding that in fact the patient has choices uh, and you say the only choice the patient has are those which are absolute, are in fact options that are available. So you begin with, I always tell them, we make a huge mistake in ethics beginning with what should I do. The first and much more important question is what is going on? What's happening? What is the clinical situation? And until you have that clarified, choices don't exist. Laney, do you want to speak to Is there just one, one mic and one Ella? Okay. Oh, okay. So I think we're all missing that the concept of respect for persons has both a positive and a negative component. And we're focusing on this negative component of liberty and that I have the right to make decisions and choices. But there's also a positive component, which is what's being missed, which is that as physicians, we have an obligation to help patients make the right choices which can get into the medical indication, but actually goes beyond that because it really still remains focused on the patient's preferences, which says that we as healthcare providers need to help educate them to make the right informed decisions, and those right informed decisions really are dependent upon the medical indications. And so I think we've all missed the concept, and moving from respect for persons to respect for autonomy is the real error. I, I, I remember. I, I remember um, working with Jim Gustafson early on. You, you heard about that yesterday. Uh, Jim had come to Chicago in 7071 and um, was one of the founding members of the Hastings board, had, had trained 
uh, trained at, at the Yale Divinity School people like uh, Al Johnson and Jim Childress and Gene Outka, uh, 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 Sam How uh, Stan Hauerwas, sort of uh, the, the, that early generation of theological ethicists. Jim always emphasized to me exactly what Laney has just said, that that, that medical decision, uh, this was his image, uh, so I'm not creating the image, that medical decision making was very different from being offered a menu in a restaurant. Uh, that, that, that was Jim's image. That, that, that going to a restaurant and having the waiter hand you a menu, it really didn't matter much, if at all, to the waiter, whether you chose a fish entree or a meat entree, whether you chose the pecan pie for dessert or the cherry pie. I, I mean, the waiter was simply there uh, to be of service and, and to be gracious. He said, medicine is not like that. It does matter. It has to matter. If it doesn't matter, there's something wrong with medicine. That, that, that any choice is equally reasonable and acceptable because of course it's not the case that that cherry pie and pecan pie are the same as choosing radiation therapy or surgery if, if in fact one or the other is needed. The doctor has to be committed, has to be involved, has to be structuring, has to be advising, has to be teaching. And then the, of course the ultimate question for Jim was but it, how far can the doctor go? Uh, I mean, what are the limits? What, I mean, it's just, just like a waiter who says, you better eat the cherry pie. <laughs> you don't or, want the cherry pie. <laughs> or, or, you, or else, I mean, how far is legitimate? And Jim would never tell me. That's, I mean, that's a Dan, take a stab at it. No, I got, Laney, I think that um, Al's point historically, we may disagree with this, um, was that in the enunciation of respect for persons, it was already sort of cast from the beginning uh, as a historical matter, uh, whether that's what was intended or not, as, um, as liberty. Um, and I think he thinks that's just what, what happened. Um, but I think he might agree with you that, res uh, that respect for persons, if it's taken as he's suggesting it in a Kantian sense, uh, would, be, uh, would be a better uh, a principle, um, but he's also saying that that contains two things, right? One is Kant's sense of autonomy, right, is not Mill's sense of liberty, right? That autonomy means that we act um, in, 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 in a way that our will is determined by nothing but accordance with the moral law. That's not exactly, then you're free, right, because you're not influenced by anything else but morality. So that's a very different notion of what it means to be an autonomous being uh, than Mill's uh, notion of liberty. Um, and there's also, he's I think suggesting, there's a relational aspect um, that we miss in Kant too, um, in the sense of the kingdom of ends, that we also respect each other collectively um, um, and that we're not simply um, individual atom atoms um, but are connected to each other. Um, and that his point, I think, well taken in this paper is that um, we never really think about that in terms of uh, the doctor-patient relationship as, a, as a, uh, a kingdom of ends, as this mutual um, respect for, uh, uh, for persons that, that Kant was looking for. So Mark. I think it's interesting. Go ahead, Park. Mark, I was struck by um, what seemed like a little disjunction between your enthusiasm for the seventh edition and Johnson's lament for these great failing that you guys have collectively uh, um, uh, been a part of. And I, I wonder, I mean, it seemed to be deeper than just the ordering of the chapters. Uh, his reflections on this. And I wonder, uh, given, I think all of our experience of you has been that your, your intuitions, your, your uh, sensibilities are not uh, along the lines of a autonomy-driven patient sovereignty model. And yet, I wonder if at this stage, say in the seventh edition, or going forward, if you conceive of a way of repenting <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and turning back or, or turning at least toward a, a, a model that might sort of say wholesale, we, we are not just going to tweak this, but we need to start over in our conceptualization of, of the doctor-patient relationship. Whoa. Don't go with me. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I 
like the I like the way you put the um, the revisionist tendency in the theological language of repentance. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I, I think there are things to be said and done in the seventh edition and, and uh, hearing, hearing Al's paper I think opened open the door to those possibilities that perhaps we've not had quite sufficient courage to do in some of the earlier versions. Um, I, I, I've always written about three or four times more than, than ends up in the first chapter on the doctor-patient relationship, on the evolution of the relationship, on uh, you know decision-making in the face of uncertainty, on, on the need for um, the explication and understanding of the goals of the participants in, in that interaction the things that Ed Pellegrino has taught us throughout his illustrious career uh, about, uh, about the healer and, and, and the one who needs healing and, and how, how the language they use to talk to one another helps define the, the, the functions and the goals of that interaction. It's historically grounded, it's philosophically grounded, it's ethically grounded, and it's clinically grounded. And, um, uh, I think there's more to be said about that. Um, I, I, I would also remind Al, um, I'd also remind Al about a section that, that we, again, we fought over, uh, but has remained as one of the mainstays of chapter two. Chapter two is this chapter about the tension between autonomy, liberty, um, uh, preferences, it's called patient preferences, and informed consent. That chapter, I, I, for, for those of you who have read any of the editions from we've the first, memorized. from the first, oh, you've memorized the first to the sixth. That chapter on patient preferences does not start with the law, does not start with philosophy, does not start with informed consent. It starts with five or six pages entitled "The Importance of Patient Preference." Some of you will remember that. And, and the importance is clinical importance, psychological importance, emotional, clinical, psychological, legal. Uh, there were five concepts on why, on why respect and adherence to the preferences of individuals is important, deeply grounded, I think, in the philosophical concepts and the legal concepts, but also clinically grounded. Um, and and that, that's an area that also, I think, is open to expansion and revision, based, again, on this, this really elegant paper that, that Al, Al sent us and, and that John presented. One last question from Sue McRae, because she's had her hand up the longest, but she's so meek that Ella keeps walking past us. <laughs> Thanks, Mark. I just want to say a little bit about what I heard Al say, and I think that the challenge that came through is really picking up on this kingdom of ends, and that the polarization of either paternalism or sort of rampant patient autonomy actually misses the point. And I think that where, where I get stuck in clinical ethics and what I'd like to challenge you in your next edition to think about is actually more than just a couple pages of what patients we should think about with patients, but in an actual rigorous taxonomy of patient and family perspectives on clinical ethical issues. What isn't in the literature that I can find is looking at clinical ethics issues when they emerge and actually hearing how the staff have defined the issue, but then going to the patient and family and understanding that same issue from the perspective of patients and family. So it's like, I, I think your point of, um, medical care being adequate, technologically sound, appropriate, first and foremost is, is core to medical science. And I think in clinical ethics, we have to challenge ourselves like Jack Wenberg asked us to yesterday, that within that context of medically appropriate options, we begin to take patient choice as a, a primary um, guide for our understanding of ethical issues and, and medical choice. Uh, I, 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 I... 
I hope others will answer, but I, I, I can't agree more. Uh, of course, the, the person who raised the question, Sue McRae, um, is, is someone who has one of the deepest and longest experiences in, in the patient-centered movement in medicine. Sue, Sue uh, trained as a nurse, uh, trained here, uh, was the head of the clinical ethics program at Toronto for a dozen years, um, has written and practiced uh, exactly the, the kind of patient-centered medicine she, she raised in her question. Um, that, that's a major failing. It's, it's in evolution in the medical literature, thanks in large part uh, to the kind of work that you and your group have done. Um, and, uh, and, and it ought to find its way uh, more closely uh, in, into the book on clinical ethics. I, I agree. You, you, you'll send me some notes about it, and, and I will continue, I'll work on that. Let's, okay. let's take a 20-minute break, come back at quarter of 12, and thank our panel. <laughs> <laughs>